I'm a neuroscientist, and I uh, spent the last 10 years looking at the brain from various angles. And I want to talk to you today for a little bit about the question of how unique are we and what can science teach us about how we decide things and what do decisions tell us about ourselves. When I was a kid, my grandfather used to tell us uh, this thing that kind of shaped my view of uh, how unique I am. He used to say, you are very unique just like everyone else. And what he meant by that is that uh, we are very unique, but at the same time, uh, there's something to humans, something to our psyche, something to how we behave that is kind of true across people. And in fact, if you know enough people and you know enough about their behavior, you can somehow start predicting how populations are going to work out, regardless of the one individual. So I want to talk to you about uh, games and how to use them when it comes to the brain. And, about our work and what we did with it that kind of shows how the brain perceives the moment we make decisions. But I want to start by actually focusing on the word change here. So, so we're talking about games, we're talking about change. And what we learned in the last couple of years, we started looking at the brain and how it influences who we are, is that in many ways our psychology is not accessible to us, in the sense that our brain knows more about who we are than we ourselves. And if we ask people to make decisions, to explain the decisions, oftentimes what comes out is that people don't have a good answer to why they do what they do. They kind of come up with an answer, with a story, and they believe that it's true, but more and more we see that it's not really aligned with who they are. And I can give you examples. The simplest example would be the fact that many times you, in your brain, decide to do something, and then it doesn't happen. And you, your own brain, is not doing that. So here's a simple game we can all play together right now. Uh, talk about behaviors that you uh, want to do but don't do. How many of you in the last month, uh, let's say one month, uh, have eaten more than you thought you should? <laughs> How many of you, keep your hands high, have exercised less than you think you should? <laughs> How many of you... Uh, have texted while driving. This is New York, so not a lot of driving, but uh, how many of you did it? Now, all of you in this case know, your brain knows that there's like something bad about that, but you still do it. How many of you uh, didn't wash your hands when you left the bathroom? <laughs> this is a, okay, I'll go to easier one. How many of you procrastinated more than you wanted this month? Oh, that's an easy one. Keep your hands. How many of you had unprotected sex with somebody you don't know? Incidentally, we study lying right now in the lab, so uh, <laughs> in other words. So the point is, in all of those situations, something happens that we decided in our brain we won't do or we want to do something else, and somehow we still end up the guys who behave differently. And the question is, who then is the person in control? Who in our brain makes the choice to run a marathon? And who is the person that says, after two miles, you know what, I think I should stop tomorrow, I'm going to run a marathon? The same person that sets the alarm at midnight to 6 a.m., and then when they wake up at 6 a.m., they see, I don't know who this person was, but clearly they're mistaken, I need a few more hours. And we actually have a button now that we can press that allows us to stay asleep for five more minutes, because the five minutes is the difference between me being tired to me being awake. So all of those are moments that our brain behaves in a pattern that sits in it and doesn't really tell us a lot about what we are. Okay, so in the context of my work recently, I use neuroscience to explain people's decision making. So I work in a business school at times, trying to help MBA students, trying to help uh, companies understand how their customers think, how they make decisions, and also how we can change people's uh, decision making process. And what we learn more and more is that many companies have a hard time understanding their customers when they ask them questions. And that's because people tend to not be accurate when they answer and explain how they make a choice. And there's two types of reasons for those uh, mistakes. One type is, I, I use examples of uh, two industries that uh, I was involved with to kind of highlight the two moments where we ask questions, we get answers, but the answers aren't really reflective. Those industries are the organic food industry and the pornography industry. Now, there's very little in common between those two industries, other than the fact that they reflect two types of moments where people are asked a question, give an answer, and the answer isn't really complete. So when I lived in Los Angeles many years ago, I lived in a zip code 90036, it's in West Hollywood, a very uh, athletic and uh, healthy uh, zip code. Everyone there is really in, uh, involved in like, their local gym, they really care about uh, eating healthy food. At some point, there was a survey in the zip code by a supermarket, and they said we're going to want to open another supermarket in this neighborhood that's going to be even healthier than the existing ones, but it's going to be more expensive. Now, how likely are you, people, to come to the supermarket knowing that it's more expensive but even better for you? 
and the turnout was 100%. Everyone who got the survey said we're definitely gonna go to the supermarket. So they opened the supermarket, and they closed after one year because no one came. Because somehow, at the end of the day, when you said, okay, I need to get milk, uh, milk in Whole Foods cost $5, and milk in this supermarket from, you know, with cows that were milked on Mars, and they, they, they turned gold, uh, uh, wasn't that uh, interesting for people. They didn't want to do it, so they just bought the already expensive milk, but not the one that is even more expensive. Now, the question is, how come a survey asks a question, everyone gives you the answer that they're going to buy, and then they, they, and they don't show up? It's because many times we answer questions not like who we really are, but who we want to be. You probably all know it. Uh, there's a spike in uh, people uh, signing up for gym memberships around January 1st. Because last year I didn't really exercise, but next year definitely I'm going to be different. And, and right now is the time to sign for memberships for that. Uh, we buy jeans for the skinnier version of ourselves, thinking that, okay, right now I'm size X, but uh, I'm just going to buy these jeans, and in a few weeks it's going to fit perfectly. We do all those things that kind of answer questions the way we want to be, rather than the way we actually are. That's one type of problem, that asking people about how they decide, how they choose, doesn't really reflect the answer because you don't really have access to full spectrum of how they think. The pornography example was one that happens when I was working here in New York not long ago. Uh, five blocks from here, we were interested in knowing something about the bandwidth at NYU uh, uh, University uh, dorms. So we kind of looked at the, uh, at the bandwidth and what people use it for, and we also had a survey where we asked 1,000 students, what do you use the internet for, and, uh, and what kind of in percentage is mostly happening? And we also asked them, uh, how often do you watch porn on your computer? And the answer was that out of 1,000 people, only one guy watches porn. <laughs> now, if you look at the bandwidth, it's about 20% of the bandwidth, which means that this guy is really active. He's uh, awake all day long. <laughs> He's in all the dorms at the same time. He's really watching. So most likely, people just didn't want to answer the question. And in both of the cases, if I try to get access to answers to how you think, I won't just get the full answer. And this is not just true for uh, those examples. It's true for a lot of times. If I ask you why you did what you did, you're going to give me an answer. But this answer likely to be incomplete. So the question is, do we actually ourselves understand our choices, or is it not even accessible to us? Turns out that more and more, we have evidence that uh, even in your brain, there's more than one character, there's a number of people who sit inside your head, and they together vie for dominance and compete when you have to make a choice. And at the end, they vote on the option, and only then, when they have a unanimous vote or even just a majority, they kind of bubble up the answer to you, and you get access only to the bottom line. You don't know that when you went to the supermarket and you looked at Colgate and Crest, and you kind of had a debate in your mind, well, Colgate is a little bit cheaper, but Crest has a whitening co a component to it, but uh, I like the package here, and I like the size of this, and in the end, all those votes come to a conclusion, and you just pick up the, say, Colgate, and you think, this is what I wanted. You never say, you know what, I only 51% wanted this, and 49 the other percent. I kind of just thought that this is what I chose, and this is how we expand our life. We always have access only to the bottom line, and we think that this is what we always wanted, and we create a narrative around our ultimate choice. Now, in the last couple of years, neuroscientists actually started to look at the brain and poke inside, and they started to see that we can actually look at the brain, and in looking, we can identify all the components that are involved in a choice. We can actually see that this guy said Crest, this guy says Colgate, and this is the parameter that uh, it uses, and ultimately, we can actually predict your choice before you are aware of it. And then we ask you to explain your choice, and we see the gap between what you say is the reason and what your brain considered. What's amazing, is that it's so inaccurate that at times we can even change things and you would not know. So in the classical experiment that we did to show that everyone can have this experience, we took people and brought them to the lab and we said, okay, here's the experiment. We're going to bring it to the lab. We're going to have you sit down. We're going to show you two cards with pictures of, say, men. And we're going to have you tell us who you find more attractive. So a simple choice, right? You don't have to think hard. You don't know any of them. It's just a simple attraction, nothing really complex. You don't know anything about the guys. Here are two cards. Make a choice. So people look at the card and they say, hmm, the card on the left. They say, fantastic, take the card you pick and explain to us in one sentence why you picked this person. So the experiment goes like that. People come, they sit for an hour, they see many, many pairs of pictures, they make a choice, take the card, explain why, move on. We do it many, many times. However, there is one trick in this experiment, something that we did that the experimenter knows but the subject does not, which is every 10 trials or so, the guy who hands you the card, who is a magician, gives you the card you didn't choose. So you have two options, and you chose this one, he would give you the other one, using sleight of hands. And here are the two interesting things that happened. One, people rarely notice that the card they received wasn't the one they chose. <laughs> and second, more interesting, is they then 
explain to us why they wanted the car they didn't pick. <laughs> so in a circle of one, five seconds, you make a choice, you get the opposite, and you explain why you wanted this. Think about yourself, right? Like you choose, you go to the supermarket, you choose Colgate, you put it in a basket, and five seconds later I ask you why you chose Crest. And you say, well, I always like the whitening component. This means that we can't really trust our own brain to explain reality because all the brain knows is how to look at the present moment, load memories that it thinks are real, and then wave these into a story. We don't really have access to the experience all the time. Everything that happened goes to memory, and then when we have to explain it, we just load it, and we explain it. And we have one thing that we always believe is true, which is that our memories are accurate. We never question and doubt our very own memories. There's like a t-shirt uh, that uh, my students uh, like to wear that says, don't believe everything you think. Because the one thing that we always believe is that our brain is accurate. We never question our own brain. What we show in those experiments is that this is not the case. Our brain can be easily fooled. In a five second gap, if you don't really think that someone can actually cheat and change the cards, you will explain, explain whatever card you got as if it was your choice. Think about the experience of the supermarket. You go to the sh uh, shelf, you took the Colgate, you put it in the basket, you keep moving around. At some point between you making a choice and you getting a checkout, I actually sneak into the basket and replace the Colgate with the Crest. When you get the checkout, you're gonna buy it. And if I ask you, why do you buy Crest? You're gonna give me answers. You're gonna say, well, I like Crest because of so-and-so. This means that I can actually change your entire reality by just changing the rules and making you not aware of them. So again, do we have free will and do we know how we decide? Well, it turns out that in our brain, we don't have full access to how we decide and we just have access to the story that we make after the fact. More than that, what we learned in the next couple of years is that a lot of things affect our choice that are not accessible to us in the sense that they, we really don't know that they're important, but they are. I'll give you an example. In the US, you're a little bit more likely than chance to become a dentist if your name is Dennis. Now, you all laugh right away because it makes no sense, right? Why would people whose name is Dennis will choose to be a dentist? Like, the, the, you know, you choose the profession at age 30, your parents give you your name age one. Why would the name they give you determine everything that you're gonna be in your profession? Like, what in those 35 years in between, nothing happened? The reality is that uh, this is the fact. There's more Dennis called, dentists called Dennis. And if you ask them, why did you choose the profession? They won't say, well, my name was Dennis, so I kind of sent, okay, that's like a, <laughs> they would come with a story. What we learned is that this is part of a field that's known as embodied cognition which is suggesting that uh, people reflect in their behavior and in their choices something about the environment. As in, a guy called Dennis actually lived his life many years, and every now and then someone was speaking about dentists, and he said, sorry, what? Oh, dentists, sorry, I thought you'd call me. And actually, they heard about dentists more than the average because it sounded like their name, to the point that when they got to be 30, 35, and actually make a choice, dentists were higher in their weights. They actually knew more about it. They still made a free choice, but somehow their choices were kind of nudged a little bit by something that is uh, auditory. And it's true for a lot of people. It turns out that a lot of people in the US, more than chance, are likely to marry someone whose initials sound like their name. Turns out, in the context of uh, uh, experiences that are political and policy uh, related, uh, when Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast, uh, New Jersey and New York, people donated money for the relief, and a lot of money came from people whose name was Sandy, Sarah, Sally, Samantha. Somehow people heard more about Hurricane Sandy if their name somehow sounded like it, and you know, now we can think about policy. In the US, we just name hurricanes alphabetically without any purpose. Now we can say, okay, a big hurricane is coming to New Orleans. Uh, let's see what names are popular in the US right now. Name the hurricane this way, and we're gonna get more money for the uh, hurricane relief afterwards. So in a way, those, those ideas suggest that, that something about the world actually changes how we think. In a study that was run here in New York a few months ago, a few years ago, sorry, people uh, were asked to come to the lab they were seated down, got a piece of paper, a cup of tea, uh, and were told for the next 10 minutes to write something about their relationship with their mothers. Write whatever you want about your mom and you. This is a very Jewish experiment. They will sit there and they write about their mom, and turns out that if you had people analyze the context, what you saw is that there's seemingly two types of people who wrote different types of essays. One group wrote very nice and, and loving and warm things about their mothers and theirs, and the other group wrote nasty and mean things about their moms. And what determined more than anything which group you fall into was the cup of tea that you received when you entered the room. Group number one received a cup of hot tea and they were asked to hold it in their hands while they're writing. And this actually left a feeling of warmth in their body which made them actually write different things. The other group got a cup of iced tea and wrote mean things. Now the thing is, we probably had both those things in your mind. People had all of the thoughts in their mind, but somehow the feeling in their body actually shaped their choice by moving them one or the other. 
And what we learned in the last couple of years is that this field of abundant conditions has a lot of manifestations. Temperature, the height of the chair, the weight of the papers, all of those things somehow penetrate our choice. But importantly, we would never argue that our choice was determined because of that. We fall in different groups, but we would never say, you know, I wrote something mean because you gave me a cup of iced tea, that's why. They, we would come up with an answer. And what we learned is that this is what humans do. They take reality and they weave it into a story and whatever they have in their mind right now becomes the narrative that we create without knowing that there are other components that drive who we are. So in the last couple of years, neuroscientists actually said, let's study the brain and see if we can find out what determines a choice. And the reason they studied the brain has a, a clear, a obvious a reason, because we learn more and more that to explain our psychology, one needs to look at the source, at the kernel, at the root of who we are, and more and more we have evidence that uh, the one place that actually has all the answers is the place between our two ears that contains everything that we can get access to and the parts that are unconscious. Uh, and what we know is that changes in the brain actually may change our behavior entirely without us having the ability to explain why. I'll give you an example or two. Um, judging by the few people I see, uh, uh, I think that none of you were alive or definitely very old to remember the case in 1966 when a, a guy called Charles Whitman took a cab from his uh, apartment in Austin, Texas, to the University of Austin. He got there, he climbed the tallest tower at the university, stood at the top, pulled a rifle, an AK-47, and started spraying people down below. He killed 14 right away, then he waited for the uh, ambulance to show up and help those, and he reloaded his rifle and shot them, and for the course of the next hour, he kept killing people again and again, and ultimately killed 50 and injured 150 people before the police actually climbed up the tower and killed him. And since this was a rare thing that never happened before, people were shocked. The entire country was like in, un, unable to, to identify what, what's behind this story. Like, why would a man suddenly do that randomly? So the police investigated the source. And they went to his neighborhood and tried to see what story uh, uh, he can tell about this guy. And this was a classical story of a, a great guy. He was a great neighbor. He was a great friend. He was discharged honorably for the Marines the year before. He had a steady job, a good relationship. Everything was normal about this guy. They couldn't find anything that would justify or explain why he behaved the same way until they found his diary. So buried under his bed, he had a little diary that he kept meticulously in the months leading to this event where he wrote that he feels that his brain is changing. He said, I'm not myself. I don't know why I have these awful thoughts. He goes to a psychiatrist who actually gives him pills that's supposed to help him but don't help him. And the night before the killing, he actually writes in his diary, I have these weird, awful thoughts. I'm worried I'm gonna do something bad and even end up dead. If I do, I need someone to look at my brain and explain why I do those things. And he even leaves a check for $30,000 for this to be done. So the police actually do that. They, they open his brain and they look inside. What they see is a massive tumor pressing on a part of the brain right at the center called the amygdala that has to do with fear and aggression and may have led to this behavior. We wouldn't know. But here's a case we can know a lot about, much more. A case that happened seven years ago in San Diego where a woman calls the police and says, my husband that I've been married to for the last 10 years with a perfectly normal sexual appetite, he woke up one day and he became a pedophile. You gotta come and arrest my husband. I have a four-year-old daughter and I'm worried about her. And the police come and indeed they arrest the husband and they take him to court uh, because they find child pornography in his computer. And uh, on day one of the trial, he complains about a headache and everyone ignores that. And he complains about it again on day two. On day three, he has a seizure in the courthouse. So they rush him straight to the courthouse to the emergency room where a neurologist look at his brain. And what they see is again a tumor uh, on the left frontal part of his brain, a huge one that should have caused him pain and, and, and other uh, symptoms before, but nothing somehow happened. They send him straight from the ER to the operating room where a surgeon puts him on general anesthesia, removes the tumor and wakes him up. And when he wakes up, he no longer has a tumor, but he also is no longer a pedophile. He says, I don't know what happened to me. This was a weird case. I, I really feel ashamed, embarrassed. I, I, I don't know what happened. And in a very, very unusual and unprecedented ruling, the judge actually writes in her, in her uh, uh, kind of summary that she, he would get to go home on probation. He doesn't get to prison. And she says, because he wasn't uh, able to control his behavior, it was his brain. Now we can ask the question, who is me and who is my brain? What's the, what's the separation between those two? But he gets sent home. And this is an interesting story, but it actually has a twist that makes it even more interesting because 10 months later, the wife calls again and says, you know, my husband is again a pedophile. You have to do something about it. This time they know what to do. They take him straight to the hospital, look at his brain, and what they see is that part of the tumor metastasized and grew back. So they have him go to a second surgery and remove the additional residue. And when he wakes up from the second surgery, again, he's going back to his normal behavior. 
This is like a controlled experiment. You have it one way, you behave one way, something changes in your brain, you behave differently, and you bring it back, you behave the same, and so on, just to show you how all of us can have changes happen to our personality, to who we are, that we have no control over. And we would never explain that. We wouldn't say, this is why I chose to behave this way. And do we even have free will in that, can, in that context? Now, we can talk about cases that are extreme, like these two guys, and say, okay, well, this is very weird and unusual, but you can all think about yourself. Tonight, in the reception that happens maybe after this conference, you're gonna all take a little bit of ethanol and put it on your mitosal glands in the form of wine or beer, and suddenly everything changes. Everyone looks cuter and nicer. Everything is funnier. We all know this experience where we do things to the brain that we easily change and everything changes. And we can't really explain how it is that the same brain can do two things, but we know that it could happen to all of us. So what neuroscientists like they do, like myself do, is we look at the brain and we try to map a choice from the moment you can say, I want the Colgate, to the moment before where your brain kind of bubbled up with the idea, to all the voices in your head that you don't have access to that compete before a choice actually is being made. And right now, because of the type of work that we do that involves actually opening the brains of patients, putting electrodes inside during surgery, and looking at the choices before they happen, we can get to a few seconds before you are able to experience the choice and know that you're about to make it. So we can actually say, okay, next you're gonna have a menu with three items, a salmon, steak, or salad, what do you wanna choose? And then we say, okay, just a second, before you make a choice, we're out of salad. And you say, oh my God, I was about to say salad. Well, never mind, you still have two options. Oh, just before you choose, there's no salmon. Oh, I was so we can actually now get to the point where we know about your choices enough before you make them, if we can actually change reality and, and, and make things work differently. And this, of course, brings a big question of what is free will? Now, what we don't know is when the moment of T0, when the moment that your brain actually makes a choice, we still don't have an answer. It's like asking what happened before the world began. We don't have an answer to where a choice originates. But what we do know is a choice actually happens way earlier than you experienced that. So when I choose to say, raise my left hand, I experienced this as soon as I thought about it, I made it. But what we know is that maybe seconds, maybe milliseconds before I did it, someone could have put electrodes in my brain and know exactly that I'm gonna do that without me being aware of that. So whatever we call free will, maybe exists, maybe doesn't, but it definitely doesn't happen in real time. The choice, free or not, happens in your brain seconds before you experience that. And this is a big change in how we perceive the world because it makes us feel that something about our brain is weird. It knows who I am before I know. And the brain is one component, but it actually even ties to a bigger thing, which is population level choices. One of my favorite examples to my students that shows how weird we are is one where we go to a website that uh, allows you to play the game rock, scissor, paper online. Now you probably all know this game, right? You have to kind of make a choice between rock, scissor, paper, and someone else makes another choice, and between the two of you, there's a winning and a losing or a tie. So you can play this game many times online. It's very, very simple. There's a website that allows you to play this game online against a computer. So again, you make a choice. The computer makes a random choice between three options. You play, you win some, you lose some, you tie some. Very simple. However, you can actually play the game in two modes, basic mode or advanced mode. Now, you kind of ask yourself, what is advanced mode in the game of rock, uh, paper, scissor? Like it's kind of, a, turns out that in basic mode, the computer just randomly makes a guess every round and it just wins and loses some. That's it. Usually you play 20 rounds, you win 10, you lose seven, you tie three. If you play it in advanced mode, the computer plays the first 20 rounds against you the same way, just randomly making choices. But after round 20, it goes to a database with 200,000 people who played the game before you, and it finds someone that played the game the same way you played in the first 20 rounds. And then it plays against you the way it would play against them if they continued playing. As in, it looks at how they played maybe 100 games, and it starts just playing against you the same way they were to play. And what happens is that after 20 rounds, you never win again. You either tie or you lose, but somehow the computer finds this person in the world that looks exactly like you, and just plays against you the way it plays against them, and you start losing all the time. And you say, this makes no sense, I'm gonna be random. I'm, I wanna do paper, I'm gonna do rock. And the other guy did the same thing. And you start realizing that it's not that we're not unique, we are, it's just that the world is so rich, and choices are sometimes are so limited, that if you live a world with fewer choices and a very kind of compressed set of options, we can start predicting your choices not without even looking at your brain, just by seeing your past. And this is what a lot of companies are working on right now, right? What is big data? They just take all the history of a lot of people and see how they behave, they look at you and they say, okay, how similar are you to this, that, or those people? And then they start uh, responding to your actions and what happens time and again is that we see that companies are really, really good in predicting things about us that even we don't know about ourselves, just by seeing how we behave. So now, to the final part, which is, can we then use all of that to change things? 
So the last four years of neuroscience actually showed us that the brain isn't static, that we can actually change things uh, dramatically in a very fast way. And it was known for a while that the brain is plastic and it changes and the personality lies in the context of the connections. But right now, we actually started to learn how to change them. And we learned that there's moments in your life that actually are really, really powerful. We can change things. So one of the moments that is really explored in the last couple of years is a, a, a moment where your guards are down, you're very volatile, and you're most likely to change without you a, having a resistance, and that's when you sleep. So it turns out that a, a sleep isn't just a uniform thing. It's made of different moments, different components, and there's small windows overnight when you're sleeping where your brain essentially gets information from the outside world and uses it to kind of change our reality. And if we target the brain at this moment and we spray smells, play sounds, activate your brain using all kinds of techniques that will make you move your options in different directions, we can actually ha have you go to sleep a smoker and wake up not wanting to smoke. This is a study from two years ago. Or go to sleep a, a, with some biases, like say you don't like some type of people or you do like a, some type of people too much and in, in, in doing so you kind of alienate other people. Over a nap of three hours, if you target the brain at the right moment, you can actually have a person wake up with a different viewpoint. Now this is at its inception. It's a very, very early stage of this research, but what he shows is that our brain really is open for changes, and the more we know about how it works, we can actually start using that to really change behavior. And where it becomes really connected to gaming is that right now we're learning that the brain changes when experiences happen all the time, some of them without us knowing about them. So an example I gave a few days ago that's really uh, interesting is that throughout evolution, for many, many years, we learned that jumping from tall places uh, kills us. So uh, people who jumped from tall places actually didn't get to have kids, so we have in our brain less residues of these people, and ones that were staying away from high places actually were more scared of those are the ones who survived and became our ancestors. And this is why when we were born, we already have fear of heights, heights in our brain. The same way monkeys, when they're born day one, if you show them a picture of a snake, they get scared. They've never seen snakes in their life, but they're born with the knowledge that snakes are scary for them. We have some uh, fears of the darkness, of loud no noises. We already have that in our brain. Now with VR, for example, you can have a person put the goggles on their face, see a tall tower, and be asked to make a step and, and, and go away. What you do if you try it uh, is feel scared. You say, okay, I, I you know it's a, a game, but I'm really uh, afraid of doing that. And people kind of shake and their heart rate goes up and their respiration is a little bit higher. But ultimately, some of them actually make the leap and they would fall in the game. And they actually say, okay, this is like an exciting moment. I tried something, it works. What we learn is that those experiences actually change our brain. As in our brain, who never actually worked through a, a world where you try to fall off a cliff and nothing happens, actually gets rewired if you do it enough times, such that time number 10 is not really as scary, which actually means that it's not just like a, a simulation that we play, it actually has an effect on our brain that makes our wiring work differently. And what we learn is that during dreams, during games, during experiences that actually create a simulation, where the world that we experience is not the same one that is in our mind, we can actually change the brain. So dreams, I said once, are the ultimate VR because you actually cannot you know, take the goggles off. They're so real for us when we have them that we experience them as if they're reality. And only when we wake up, we say, oh, this didn't happen. But for the point of view of the brain during the dream, it actually feels like it's real, it's happening. And in that sense, it changes our brain. So now that we can actually control your dreams and start changing them and injecting ideas into your dreams, we can actually start creating changes in your behavior entirely. So those of you who raised your hand in the beginning and said, I drove and drank, or I uh, texted and driven, or I uh, went to the gym too little, can now have usage of games or dreams or neuroscience to really open up and understand how you decided what to do, who in your brain is the one who controls the choices, and how we can actually change it and give you access to the part of the brain that you normally don't have access to. So where I want to end is the last sentence is to say that uh, one of the things that's uh, important to me is that the more we understand the brain, we understand how the choices are being made and we understand how to navigate them and even how to change them using technologies like the ones I mentioned just now, dreams on VR, we also uh, are beginning to understand uh, that the world we live in right now isn't aligned with our brain, as in, uh, one of the statistics that I was going to show you shows that uh, if you compare the number of deaths right now to those 100 years ago, you'll see that most deaths right now are uh, man-made, things we cause ourselves, like accidents or uh, overeating uh, or smoking, things that we invented and we do, compared to deaths 100 years ago, which were mostly things that happened to us. So this means somehow that the technology and the world that we're creating has problems. And the main thought that I have is that those problems come because we try to cater to the part of the brain that's not really the full story. So the alarm clock is a good example, right? We, we 
set the alarm at midnight to 6 a.m., thinking we're gonna wake up. We wake up at 6 a.m. and we were very tired, and we say, I don't know who the guy who was, but I'm not him anymore. And instead of saying, okay, it means that there's a problem in our brain, some gap between the guy who makes the choices and the guy who has to live to them afterwards, we say, how ah, can we make it easy? Let's put a button on the clock called snooze that allow us to keep lying to ourselves. And what we get better at in the last couple of years is making more complex snooze buttons. So instead of actually learning how the brain makes choices and changing them, we say, okay, what snooze button I can make that will be the best? And there's a lot of clocks that uh, uh, work well with that. There's clocks that have snooze buttons that run away from you. There's ones that uh, run away and fly in the room. There's ones that uh, explode, all kinds of ways to do it. But the bottom line is that our brain isn't really good for that. So my last sentence would be that what I want to leave you with is a skeptical approach that says that uh, the best thing you can come up with after 25 minutes with me is just to start saying, okay, I know that I make decisions all the time. I know that I explain them after the fact. Maybe I can challenge myself to see and understand how I decided by using the following analogy. 407 years ago, Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope to the moons of Jupiter, and he was looking at them trying to see how they orbit the planet, and he saw that the orbits were not perfectly aligned. It wasn't what he had in mind. And he tried to explain the equations in many ways, and the only way he could come up with an answer was to actually realign the solar system and put sun at the center and Earth as just another planet. Now, this to him felt like a dethronement of humankind. What does it mean that we're not the center of the universe? Just one more planet out there. It took him some time, but when he actually accepted that, everything changed. The world became actually richer and wider. And in the last 400 years, we explored this universe. We went farther and farther away, and so much more universe than we had in mind before. In the last couple of years, we begin to understand that in our own brain, we're not the center of the universe. We're just one more voice out there, not the most important one, but the one we think is us. And this understanding is really challenging for us. We kind of say, I don't understand what it means that I'm not the most important person in my own brain. But what we learned is that as we begin to understand that and put this speaking part of us as just one more voice rather than the only guy who decides, we get to explore the most interesting thing in the universe, which is us. Thank you. Thank you.